I've taught on this passage before, and typically I, I like to use it when we talk about apologetics, when we uh, dig into worldviews, uh, because it's so applicable to that. Uh, however, this morning I, I wanted to look at a really practical thing that you can do in order to honor what is being commanded of you in the second verse of Romans chapter 12. Uh, it's been such a rich blessing to be a part of a church body that truly loves and longs to honor God's word and the transforming of our hearts to align with the truth found in God's word. As many here will attest, this is not always an easy process. This can be difficult, uh, sometimes painful, but when we do this well, it, it bears such good fruit that is truly worth it. Therefore, as we align our hearts and minds to the truth of God's word, we also rightly worship him. The scriptures declare that God is seeking men who will worship him in spirit and in truth. So we got to see how vitally important it is that we transform our minds to line up with God's truth rather than being conformed to the world around us, to the lies and the deceit that you'll find apart from God. Having been a part of the teaching team for so long and having been a discipler for many years, I know the ways our proclamation of God's word has been a rich blessing and a hard challenge to many of you here. One of the reasons for the difficulty that we face is that we are always being discipled. We're being taught things that perhaps we may agree with, and if we are taught them long enough, they will become foundational views that we see the rest of the world and the rest of the ways that we think through. Unfortunately, this means that many of us have a large amount of unlearning that we need to do when it comes to the idea of not being conformed to this world. We've recently finished uh, our midweek series on marriage and on singleness, spoke a lot about roles for men and women, um, and I've heard from many that, that it was difficult. It was uh, a lot of weighty things that challenged a lot of views that have been held deeply, and so it was, it was hard. It was hard to process, to work through, to consider now, I, I cannot assume that a Sunday morning sermon will uh, fix that, will cure it all. Uh, I don't have a magic pill or like a, a, a special phrase that you can say that eliminates the work that's involved in that. Um, but I, I do sincerely hope that it will be a blessing to you this morning to uh, consider these truths and to be equipped with new tools, perhaps a different understanding to think through, regarding the transformation of our hearts and minds to God's word. Um, with that, I, I, I want to say that uh, my main focus and, and one of my primary examples this morning is for you ladies. Uh, so mothers, grandmothers, sisters, daughters in the faith, this is going to be uh, something that I think will be a real blessing and I focus on that because of my, my heart for you. The Lord has um, blessed me with two girls. Up until recently, I had uh, no son. Uh, and so I, I've uh, got to do a lot of life thinking of how women process things, of, of how they uh, absorb, how they uh, are met with different things from Scripture. And so uh, all of that to say, I, I have a specific focus that will be there uh, it's not an aim to like pick on or uh, a, a lack of desire for you men. I'm, I'm also going to speak to you a little bit, and there's a lot that you can uh, learn as we speak. But I just wanted to be upfront with that this morning so that it wasn't like, wow, he's only talking to you know, the ladies here. Um, uh, I am, and it's, it's purposeful uh, because of my heart for you, and I hope it's really a blessing. There's three primary points that I want to draw from our text this morning. Uh, this passage is not limited to these points. This passage is uh, something that we could preach on for, for months. You know, we could spend a week, uh, two weeks, three weeks just in verse 1 of Romans 12. Uh, so 
I want to take a, a bigger concept and then really just focus on a particular illustration to hopefully give you a practical tool when it comes to conforming, sorry, transforming your mind to the Word of God. Uh, but for you note takers, I, I did have three points, so hopefully that'll be helpful as well. Uh, point one, I want us to see God's passionate appeal to our proper or right worship. Point two, our, our worship begins by the renewal of our minds. And then point three, the discerning, sorry, discerning the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So uh, God's passionate appeal to our right worship. Uh, worship, proper worship, begins with the renewal of our minds. And then uh, how do we discern the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God? Beginning with our first point, uh, Romans chapter 12, uh, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. As a uh, side note, often when we teach or preach, we we use the name of the author of the book and we say Paul is saying or Peter is saying or John is saying. And uh, I typically try to bring the clarity that even though the author is saying this in his letter, it is therefore God who is saying it, right? Um, this clarity is important. Uh, as we've taught, the scripture was written by men carried along by God the Holy Spirit and the things they wrote, the scriptures, are God-breathed, right? Right? So when you see Paul plead with you by the mercies of God to do this thing, see God pleading with you, appealing to you by his own mercies to do this. It's as if God wrote this because in a very real and serious way, these are indeed his words to us. So all of that to say, when, when Paul pleads, God is pleading with you. And I hope you think both God and Paul, I hope, hope you see how both God and Paul pleads for this for the believers. Uh, with that clarity, let's, let's dig in. Paul has uh, just wrapped up his theological and doctrinal treatise on the gospel. Uh, Romans 1 through Romans 11, he's unpacking it in great depths. He, he wants the, the Roman people, the people who are not a people of God, to really understand what this good news is to understand what sin is, to understand their separation from God. Uh, even, I mean, federal headship and God's sovereignty and salvation, Paul really unpacks so much in those 11 chapters. And here in chapter 12, he's, he's turning the page to the practical application of what he has taught throughout his whole letter. Uh, in fact, there's... Um, a therefore that our verse starts with, and, and it's specifically referring to the last verse uh, in chapter 11, uh, but it's also encompassing all that he has already taught. So Paul gives this appeal to us, this, this plea, to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, uh, that it's our spiritual worship, and, and before he does that, he says, therefore, right? So Romans chapter 11, verse 36 says this, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. So consider all the truths taught in Romans up to this point. Paul ends this gospel treatise with the foundation for all of it, namely that it's all for Christ. It's all about Christ. From him, to him, through him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Therefore, we are being appealed to to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our spiritual worship. Now notice here there's a mention of physical and spiritual. They're, they're uniquely connected in this verse. Paul says, present your bodies, physical, which is your spiritual worship. So what we're going to consider this morning has practical application for both 
the physical and the spiritual life. This is Paul's way of saying, present your whole self to God, all of your life as a living sacrifice to him. When you read this verse, you should see that it is a a loving encouragement, a plea. Uh, Paul uses the term brethren, which is a very affectionate term that Paul used for believers. It's a plea to sacrificial living. It's a plea to presenting our entire lives to God. And this is part of why our physical and spiritual realities are combined in this charge from Paul. Notice also that it's a plea based upon the mercies of God. The the mercies of God is what fuels our sacrificial obedience, our spiritual worship of God through our lives presented wholly to him. We are to look at all areas of our lives and to present them to God for whom, through whom, and to whom all things belong. We as believers are to do this because of the awesome mercies of God to us. Christian, have you forgotten the mercy of the Lord to you? Are you caught up in the circumstances of life, perhaps even stirred to frustration or bitterness, that things aren't going the way that you think they should? Perhaps it's because you've forgotten the mercies of God. Perhaps it's because you failed to remind yourself that his mercies are new each day. Ground yourself here, Christian. Handing your life over to God in every aspect is difficult because we are fallible, we are fickle, we are weak. We come and hear the word of God preached and we sing with the congregation and we pray together and and our hearts are are kind of stirred to worship and and a joy of the Lord and then we get in the car and, and maybe if we're lucky we make it home before we shift our focus and we put those things down. If you get cut off on the way home, you might not make it home before you shift your focus, right? And the reality is that we, we, must, we must shift our focus. We, we do have things that the Lord has blessed us with that we are to steward. Uh, so we can't just stay here and sing all day, right? Uh, we can't just stay here and pray all day. We do have things that we need to give our focus, our time, our attention to. Um, however, we... We tend to see and enjoy those things and quickly change our focus to the worries and the cares of this world. We tend to turn to the things that the Lord has blessed us with and make it all about those things. You see, those blessings can be difficult at times. Children are a sweet, sweet blessing. And parents, you can amen that they can be difficult, right? Yes, thank you. One of the reasons why I think that we struggle with those realities is because we are not thinking about the foundation of the mercies of God for us. I want to move to our next point, but I want to encourage you, believer. God's mercy shown to us through our salvation and the glorious gospel of grace with which he has saved us must, it must be our foundation. It should humble us to no end to remember that we deserve death for our sin. Yet God put that death upon his son in our place. If I'm ever tempted to think I deserve better, this gospel truth resets my prideful heart. When we consider these things that God has declared as good and right and perfect and true, and if they rub us raw or they get under our skin, so to speak, The mercies of God should quickly humble us to slow down and consider that we are limited, we are fallible, and we can and often do hold views that are contrary to what God has declared to be true, to be for our good. God, who knows all things and cannot be wrong, has graciously condescended to our level to give us his truth, to give us revelation. And it is his mercy to show us why he created us and what brings him the most glory, especially when he's calling us to sacrifice our lives for his glory. 
So as we consider more of these things, let's, let's ground our understanding first in the beautiful mercies of God. All of the ways that God has shown his mercy to us Christian through our salvation and our ongoing life thereafter. Romans 12.1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Point two, worship begins with the renewal of our minds. First part of Romans 12, verse 2 is, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. God has been gracious to give us truth in his word. This, again, is a mercy of God. Therefore, we should remember that God did not owe us this revelation. He is merciful and good, and we as believers must know his word and believe that it is true. If we are going to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of our minds, then we have to, it necessitates that we have truth to contrast, to correct the deceitfulness and the lies of the world around us. When you are confronted with truth from God's word, that perhaps is uh, difficult. Maybe it's a hard pill to swallow. It's an old phrase for you. I think that it's best for you to ask yourself, first, what have I believed about this topic? And from where have I believed it? So let me say that again. When you're wrestling with a truth from Scripture, the first thing you need to ask is, well, what have I come to believe about that truth that God is presenting? And where did I learn what I've come to believe from? What is it, the foundational view that I hold? And what was the source that gave me that view. If God's word says that mankind was made as male and female, and that this clear design of God is good, that both male and female are created in his image, then what have we believed from the world around us about sex and gender that is false, that needs to be corrected by the word of God? Now, I don't think that many of you here this morning are struggling with that specific truth, Though perhaps some of you might be. If you do, I simply want to encourage you to ask yourself the question, what have I come to believe about this topic and where have I learned what I've come to believe from? Why am I believing a view about anything in creation, creation belongs to God, that is contrary to what God has declared in his word. You see, if God, who is truth and our only source of truth, as the only all knowing being that exists, has declared something to be good, then why do we not hear and believe that it is indeed a good thing? I really believe digging to the root of those things is a much more helpful step in our process of being transformed by God and his word rather than being conformed to this world. Um, here's another example. Many of you won't struggle with this at all, but uh, I know some of you who truly love God and have expressed a real tension when it comes to this topic. Consider, if you will, abortion. Abortion is the unjust taking of a human life. Therefore, this is murder. And God has declared that this is wicked and evil in his sight. We as believers must not hold a view that's contrary to that. Now, uh, the reality of the world that we live in means that there may be people here who have, for whatever reason, either had an abortion or held some view of abortion that was positive. And let me remind you, if that's you this morning, you need to go to the mercies of God. 
God's mercy is your foundation. When you consider those things, be transformed by the renewal of your mind with the foundation of the mercy of God. There is forgiveness from God for these sins. If he has given you faith, then Christ Jesus paid for that with his blood. You are forgiven. But we don't want to continue holding a view that is contrary to what God has declared to be true, acceptable, and perfect. Because we've had some experience. Perhaps we have some guilt or shame or conviction through it. And if you have dealt with this, I I would love to talk to you after the sermon. I would love to pray for you. I would love to encourage you. I would love to help perhaps... Uh, discuss the views. If you're struggling with the views, perhaps it's not something that you've done, but it's something you've really struggled with to rightly have a good view of. Um, But even if you don't talk to me afterwards, remember that Christ Jesus has paid for every sin of every believer, past, present, and future. And what you need most in this moment is to remember his mercies. His mercies are new each and every day. I think many times we wrestle with the things that we see in Scripture, and our first thought as believers, which is good, it has the right right aim, but our first thought is, well, God has said it, and so I know that it's true, that's what I proclaim, so I just have to deal with it. Well, well, yeah, yeah, you do. You're not going to change God's truth by not dealing with it. God has declared it. It is therefore truth, and we must, as believers, do business with it. However, this type of looking at things that contradict our views is is really very negative. It, It tends to create this strange kind of lasting struggle in people where they have to come back to the same topic again and again and, and really, I don't know why I don't like that, but it's so hard for me. I, I really struggle with that. I, I don't like, when I hear that from God's word, it just doesn't sit well with me. And, and I think it's probably because of the way you are or, or the way you've practiced looking at it. Well, God said it, and I know it's true, so I just have to grit my teeth and bear it and just have to accept it. And my hope is that the, the practical example of considering why you hold that view that's contrary to God's truth and where you got that view from will really help you to move forward in trusting God and believing what he said and seeing the goodness of it and, and keep you from that kind of long-term cycle of wrestling with the same truth again and again. I hope that this will help you see what God has declared to be true in a better light. Not that his truth is dim, but that our hearts, which have held on to false beliefs, can cause us to see it dimly. So just like I do in apologetics, I mean to encourage you to look at your foundation when you are considering these things. Let me say it this way. When we consider the source of the beliefs that we've held, and we consider them against the source of truth that we have in God's word, it oftentimes helps us to put away those false beliefs quicker and in a fuller, less begrudgingly sense. Um, When we see the the beauty, the mercy, the grace of God and his gospel and what he's done and his sustaining us even when we were his enemies, and then we compare that to a world that's really wicked and corrupt and longing to destroy everything that God has called good. And we go, well, I've gotten this thing that I believe from here, and I've gotten this thing that I believe from here. You you compare the sources. I'm hopeful that it will help you go, oh, well, yeah, I really do need to give that thing up. The, The source that I got that truth from is, first of all, not truth, but the source that I got that belief from is wicked. It's it's ugly. It it defames the things that God has created and calls good. Now, um, as I said from the the outset, I want to speak specifically to the women here at Disciples Church. Um, Again, I want to be clear. It's not a a, a picking on 
Or, or it's not that this verse doesn't speak also to the men. I, I just have found a, a continual... Uh, a continual? I have found a regular refrain that I've heard through a lot of different teachings that there are certain things that are struggles that um, are, are causing some like long work for you. And I'm, I'm really genuinely hoping that by working through this and, and uh, drawing our focus here, that it's a blessing, that it's helpful. Uh, and so that's my aim with this. Um, my hope of bringing this up is solely for your good. I, I truly long to see the women here believe the word of God, see that it is good, that it's for your good, and to flourish in a way that this world simply cannot comprehend. So think back to our Romans verse, do not be conformed to the image of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That this means that we have some, some head work to do, so to speak. When it comes to the things that we hold in our mind, our foundational beliefs, the ones that affect our hearts, we, we, must, we must go back to the foundation and find the reasons that we believe them. The reason that I think this is more focused or, or perhaps applicable to women is because of the world that we live in. I, I'm, and I mean uh, American, Western, uh, unbiblical worldviews. Hopefully there's enough clarities there that uh, you don't want to talk to me about this afterwards. But um, The secular Western American worldview has been at war against what God has declared good for you for easily over a century now. Uh, that's a hundred years of centuries of word you're not familiar with. I, I truly believe that that's why women typically more than men struggle with what God has declared as good for you, uh, as proper for the way he has created you as a woman. And since our country has been at war with God's view for women for so long, I think most women tend to struggle and to do so in very deep ways, never really considering why or, or what it is that they've come to believe about a specific thing that God said about his purpose in making you a woman. This does not mean that men don't struggle. I think the difference for men is quite simply that our struggle has less to do with heartfelt beliefs and more to do with practical sin like laziness and selfishness. When God declares that we are to lead, to protect, to provide, to shepherd the hearts of those that he has entrusted to our leadership, this doesn't really bother us or, or doesn't seem odd or doesn't seem unfitting as much as it kind of weighs on us, weighs against my desire to be selfish, to be lazy. I don't want to do that hard work. It's not that I don't believe that that is what he's called me to. It's not that I struggle with what he's calling me to do. It's just, and that sounds like a lot of work. I don't know if I really want to do all of that. The difference that I've noticed between the men and the women is that the struggles come back to real foundational beliefs, and it makes the struggle of renewing our minds different. For example, I don't hear much from the men that they really wrestle with the duties God has commanded them to. Again, I tend to hear that they don't want to, that they're being sinfully lazy, that, that it's, it's not as fun. They don't see it as good because of the work involved. For women, what I tend to hear is that it's hard because it doesn't feel good. They feel like they are losing something. They feel like there's a loss of value or worth. There's, there's something that kind of pulls at your heart that says, if I, if I see this and I do that, then, then I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be heard or known or I'm losing some sort of value, some sort of identity. And so my aim in addressing these things again is not to pick on anyone, but by God's grace, perhaps to provide some helpful tools to you ladies and, and to you men on this journey of transforming our minds and therefore our worship of God. Romans 12, 2, again, the first part of the verse. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Notice in our text, there is a comparison. There is a conforming to this world, and then there is a, a transforming of your mind. 
For the ladies, I think this has more to do with your heartfelt beliefs and, and again, addressing why they are what they are and where they've come from. And for the men, I think it has more to do with the practically addressing the things that we know are good but that we avoid because of our sin. Now, I, I know this to be true because God's word has declared it as such. God's word speaks much to the heart of the ladies and to the practical working out of the men. For men, if renewing our minds has business to do with our hearts, mind, hearts, it's typically in correlation with the reality that we don't think of the weighty things God has called us to as being better. Oh, I, I could give up this whatever hobby thing that I really like that's really not blessing to my family to do all of this work with my family. I don't know, that, that thing seems way easier. I like that one, right? It's a, it's a very practical thing. For the ladies, if it has to do with practicalness, it's likely because your heart rails against it. So you don't want to do it or see it as good because it doesn't feel good. Now, all of that to say, I, I realize that I can miss nuances. I know that not everybody's wired exactly the same, right? So surely there are different uh, spectrums on that range for all of us. Um, this isn't going to be an exhaustive focus on how to correct those things. And I know that you guys already get that, but I thought it would be worth just bringing that clarity. Um, so back to the text. The difference between conforming to the world and the renewal of your mind is primarily dealing with and addressing your source of knowledge. So if you're conforming to the world, your source that is helping you conform is the world. Your source of knowledge is the world. If you're renewing your mind, as the verse goes on to say, it's, it's discerning what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So you have two sources. You have the world and you have God. Don't be conformed to the world. Don't, don't take up what the world thinks you should believe and hold to, but be transformed according to God, what he has declared, what he has revealed in his will through his word. And we'll see more of that in our last point. But since God is addressing our source of knowledge in this passage, it, it seems very fitting for us to address the source of our views, especially as they relate to God's word. Uh, for example, if I were to take a poll from the ladies here, I, I wonder how many would love what God declares about the beauty of a quiet and gentle spirit. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1-4, through 4, it declares this, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives." When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. God's word, which is truth, says that there is a beauty for women that never fades. It is imperishable. It does not grow old. It does not lose its luster. It doesn't grow wrinkles. It doesn't fade in color over time. It, it, it doesn't change in shape or form. It's not just a beauty that never fades, ladies. It is a beauty that only increases with time and focus. It is a beauty that in God's sight is very precious. Scripture makes no mention of a man's action that God calls very precious. It's reserved for you. However, I'd submit to you that this is one of those passages that are really hard 
for most women to see as good and beautiful. And, and why is that? Well, let's go back to addressing what we believe and where we learned that belief from. For easily a century in modern American ideology has declared that for a woman to be quiet and gentle means that she is not valuable or worthy. The idea that this would not be good is nowhere rooted in God's word. But it has been preached to your parents and to their parents and to their parents and to their parents before them. When we consider that this view from our world has now bled even to such an absurd ideology that men can be women and women can be men, we see just how radically far the world's view of God's good creation of men and women for specific purposes and roles has gone. In fact, that source of knowledge, if if that's a view you're holding, that source of knowledge can't even define what a woman is anymore, which is absurd. Consider the current press of the world around us. If there is no such thing as man and woman, then how do we carry on being fruitful and multiplying? Uh, It's a pretty major and absurd view. If the next two or three generations do not see the wickedness for what it is, we will in a very short time lose the beauty of God's design for men and women altogether. This is why it's imperative, church, that as Christians, we see what God declares as good, and we do real unwiring of false views we may hold so that we align back up, we are transformed by the renewing of our mind to what God has declared is good and right and true, perfect, acceptable. Christian women, if the idea that a quiet and gentle spirit should be the thing you strive for and grow into is hard, if it rails against what you, you feel in your heart or think in your head, I would encourage you not to simply begrudgingly put up with it and go, well, God has said it, so it just must be true. I don't think that's going to be very helpful for you. You miss so much when that is where you kind of focus your battle. Rather, ask yourself why you disagree. Ask yourself what view you have come to believe that is contrary to what God has said, and where did you get that view from? Who taught you that? Who discipled you to believe that what God has declared is good is actually bad? I do believe that if you do that type of work, if you really get to the root of those beliefs, uh, I believe that it will be a sweet blessing to you. It will be very helpful for you. Uh, let me ask you this. Um, if, you, <clears throat> if you ladies as uh, young girls, if you uh, grandmas and, and, and mothers and moms, if you just older uh, women, uh, if you had learned as a, a young girl, three, four, five, that your beauty, your worth, your value was fully secure in God, that striving to be gentle and quiet was a sweet thing and that God loved it. If you had believed that, not just heard it, but but heard it and believed it, knew that it was true, If you believe that and focused your attention to growing in that, how many millions of heartaches, how many hours of lost sleep, how many outfit changes, how many days of stress, how many tears would you have been saved from if you simply believed that to be true? Just consider what the world does to women who believe that their value, worth, and dignity is wrapped up in what you see externally or what you hear, how much attention, how loud your voice can be. How many horrible plastic surgeries have women gone through to look the part? 
How many women have aged and felt less beautiful, so they've, they've cut their faces up, they've injected poison into their skin to regain what they thought, what they were discipled to believe brought them worth and value? Oh, what trouble and heartache they would have been saved from if they had only known what God's word declared and believed it to be true and good. Uh, As a daughter of girls, I was recently made aware of something that I really didn't know growing up and I really hadn't thought about. Uh, I know, you can be 40-something and still learn new things. It's amazing. Uh, As a young man, when, when I thought about how I looked, my appearance... I didn't spend a lot of time looking at my, my buddies and going, I've got to look, like, I hope he thinks I look good. I never really did that. All I did was look at the ladies around and go, man, I really hope she thinks I look good. I mean, that was, you know, the focus. I was talking to my wonderful wife and uh, considering my daughters and, and the things that I want to help them see and, and understand. And Aaron uh, kind of gave me this epiphany to me, wasn't it to her? But she said that growing up, women spent, at least in her opinion, way more time worrying about how they looked, how they compared, how their friends thought they looked, than they ever did about what the guys thought they looked like. Aaron said, my, my biggest competition was not the guys that I was interested in, it was the, the girls that were my friends or that were in my people group that I hung around with. So there's a a, a constant, constant pressure there to look, right, to this external adorning. As many times I hung out with my buddies and we looked ridiculous. (laughs) Torn up clothes and dirty and filthy, we didn't care. I didn't have that pressure. Um, And I think that's why the Lord is so clear for you ladies. This, This... Truth that he gives you in his word is not robbing you of anything. It is protecting your heart from a million heartaches. If you you believe that your beauty is wrapped up in the Lord, in, in growing in gentleness, not desiring to be heard, to be loud, to to have external attention put on you. If you believed you were secure in him. And that he found the quiet and the gentle, the internal adorning, as exceedingly beautiful. Oh, would it save you from so much heartache. That's why it's good. God knows what he's doing. He knows what he's declaring. It is not to rob you of something. This... uh, truth that my wife shared with me made me realize that if women had been taught rightly and truly believed what God declares in this verse, it would have saved them from so much heartache. I I really hope that my daughters will learn this. Um, Not just the the two that are sitting up here, but the, the daughters that God has blessed me to be in your life since you were a kid in sixth grade. And I hope with this illustration you can see how God's good design is for you. He's for you. He's not against you. I truly believe if more women knew this and believed it, they would save themselves from so much hurt in the course of their life. You see, when we consider the source of false beliefs, it really helps us to see how bad they truly are for us. So just think about what the world has declared is best for women and consider what the outcome will be if people continue to believe it. We are probably a few short years from women being forced to sign up for the draft in case our country has to go to war. Our country is already trying to push this. This is not an exaggeration. They've already tried to pass bills to make this happen. Women, do you think that's for your good? It's absurdly wicked according to God's word. The role of fighter, the role of protector, belongs to man. The nations that force their women to fight for them are historically cursed by God. It is a pouring out of God's wrath upon them. God help me if this country requires my girls to sign up for a draft. I will not allow it to happen. It won't happen. 
But think about it. How long has this worldview been pushed? How, how long have you been discipled to believe that that would be an okay or good thing? As, I, as I'm working through this and thinking about it, the, the first movie that popped in my mind was Mulan. Came out in 1998. I was 18. Remember watching it? I had all girl cousins, so I saw all of the princess movies all of my life. <laughs> uh, and I liked it. There was bow and arrows in it. There's war. What guy doesn't like war? If you like this movie, as I once did, I am not trying to destroy the things you've enjoyed. But, for example, many of the women who are in here were not even born in 1998. So for all of their life, the stories, the movies, the discipleship that the world has pushed upon them is that they should do whatever they want. They could pretend to be a man to go to war to protect their family. In fact, women taking on the role that God has commanded men to take, it's not only good, it's right. It has riches and glory. They become the hero. And if you want value, you've got to be the hero, right? I wonder how many men bled to death in wars for our good, and no one even knows their name. Not, it's not a hero stand that they get to be on, right? Now take this one example and go back even further. This movie was based on a Chinese folk song written somewhere between 386 to 535 AD. AD. That's how long ago this story came about. In 557 to 589, they, they took this song and, and they wrote stories about it and made more songs about it. And so I've mentioned that for easily a century, this country has promoted things that are contrary to God's good design for women. But what we see when we peel this back even further is that the, the world's been promoting things contrary to what God has called good since the fall in the garden, since the temptation to Eve. Eat this fruit, you'll be like God. And I truly, truly hope that it's helpful for you to consider this. If you've spent your entire life being trained by a world um, that for a woman to be quiet and gentle is a bad thing, then no wonder you struggle with this beautiful truth from God's word. No wonder. All the arguments in your head, yeah, but quiet so I don't ever get to be heard? Think about why you hold those views. Think about where those things came from. The tr this truth that would protect you from heartache, from worry, from constant comparison, from never living up, that this truth that is very precious in the sight of God is just one small example of the things that you have to wrestle with because of the discipleship of the, the beliefs that the world around you has been pressing upon you since you've been alive. What I think would be most helpful for you in this is to consider, once again, what it is that you believe that's contrary to what God is declaring, and where did you learn that from? You see, when we address this foundational point, it really helps us get to the bottom of why we struggle to see what God has declared to be good as good. In this, take it one step further again and consider if you really trust the source that you've gotten this false view from, in comparison to the source of truth we get in God's word. For example, God sent his son to die for wicked sinners and to bear the wrath that we deserve for our sin in our place. What has the world around you that promotes wicked views contrary to scripture done for you? Are they even trustworthy? Even a little bit? That's a rhetorical question. If a murdering liar is telling you don't pursue quietness or gentleness. That won't bring you any joy or any good. Don't do that. That's, that's ridiculous. Do you really want to believe that source? Or do you go to the word of God to see clearly that this view that you've perhaps held is contrary to the truth of God who sent his son for you? Honestly consider which one is more trustworthy. 
And this is meant to be a, a simple practice and, and a very practical thing that I hope will be a blessing in your efforts to transform uh, your mind instead of conforming to the world. It truly is my hope that this consideration will not only help you avoid conforming to the world, adopting views that are contrary to what Scripture says, but, but that it will bring you the greatest joy that you could have because it will increase your trusting of God's truth and relying upon Him for your joy. If God has declared it, we must know it and we must believe it, Christian. Which brings me to my last point, discerning the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. I'm going to read all of verse 2, but the focus is on the second half of the verse. Romans 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The avoiding of conforming to the world and instead being transformed by renewing your mind is done through testing, according to our verse. Well, testing what? Whatever it is that you test, it must reveal to you the will of God. So where do we find the will of God for us? We compare what we already believe and what the world has declared to us over and against what God has revealed as his will in his word. Know your Bible. Believe what it says. If your Bible says that you are to sacrifice all your desires, men, for the good of your family and leading them well, then that is what is good and acceptable and perfect because it is the expressed will of God unto us in his word and God is good, acceptable, and perfect. Now, there are surely more details or nuances that we could draw out there. However, if you think you'll find more joy in laziness rather than leading your family, God clearly tells you that you are wrong. You're settling for something less because you hold a false view. You need to transform your mind to the word of God. I hope you get my point. Notice the last part of this verse declares that God's revealed will is what is good, acceptable, and perfect. So if it doesn't feel good, it's because somewhere along the line you have believed a lie. And it's warring, it's warring, battling against the truth of God's word. If it doesn't feel acceptable or perfect, it's still the same issue. Christian, the battle cry of the Reformation was semper reformanda, which is Latin for always reforming. We are always reforming our beliefs and our views to line up with God and his word, which never changes, is never wrong, always true, always acceptable, always perfect. This is where we live as Christians, church. We must take even our deepest and longest held beliefs to the word of God and make sure they line up. And again, this, this can be difficult. This can take some time. Often we are looking for ways to instead twist God's word so that it, it really lines up with what I think is best or true or right. And that's an erroneous way to do this work. It will leave you lacking beautiful truths from God for your good and for his glory. It's technically what we call eisegesis when it comes to unpacking scripture. You're reading your views into a text instead of reading what the text is declaring out of it. Renewing your mind is not easy, but it is worth it. If I could save my daughters 10 heartaches by teaching them this truth, helping them see how good it is, that it's for their good, then praise the Lord. I want to do that. I want to do that for, for you, sisters, as well. I have zero doubts that if you see what God has declared as very precious in his sight and strive for your beauty to be the hidden person of the heart, a gentle and quiet spirit, not needing attention or needing eyes or needing focus from others, but being satisfied 
in what God has declared is exceedingly beautiful to him, I have no doubt that you will not be let down. You will not come to the end of your race, ladies, and go, I wish I had been more flashy. I wish more people had given me attention. I wish I could have spoken up more and been louder and been heard. You won't stand before the Lord one day and say that, I promise you, because his word promises it. Men, if you give up the pursuits that you have in this world that do not benefit your family or honor the Lord so that you can focus more on leading and investing in your family, you will not reach the end of your days and say, I wish I had done more go-kart riding or whatever that thing is. I can guarantee it because God has called us to something greater, something better than that. God's word shows us his will and what he declares is good is indeed good. What he has revealed to us in his word, his revealed will for men and women is good, acceptable, and perfect because it comes from him. And he is good and acceptable and perfect. If you go anywhere else in this life for your knowledge, for foundational views of the things around you, you will be let down. Romans 12, 1 through 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. I pray that this will be really helpful for you. I pray that it's a rich blessing and that you will be equipped with better tools to do this work. I pray that God would be at work in you because we are desperate for him. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning and, and as we consider your word and uh, the, the work that we are called to do to, to present our entire lives as a uh, sacrifice to you, that, that everything that exists is from you and for you and to you. And so we as well are called to, to give up our lives, to, to lay them at the altar for you, so to speak. And as we consider those things, as, as we look at your word, as we wrestle through um, long-held beliefs that are not in line with what you have declared, we pray, Lord, that your spirit would be changing our minds and our hearts. We pray for the wisdom and discernment to see the, the lies that we've held to for what they are. Help us, Lord, to see the, the good things that you have called good, that you have um, revealed to us in your word. Help us to see them as good. Help us to get out of our own uh, stubborn ideologies or views. Help us to really pull the root of those things out of the ground and remove them forever that we may enjoy your word, which we know is truth. For our good and for your glory, Lord, that we may rightly worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.